Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her King. Those are the words of a wonderful 18th century Christmas carol by a man called Isaac Watts. And those words sum up the, the third theme of Advent, this series that we're doing at the moment on, on Advent, the third theme, which is the theme of joy coming into the world. Joy is a word that runs throughout the Bible, but it doesn't mean be happy or, you know, turn that frown upside down. In fact, often in the Bible, joy is talked about in situations that are very difficult or upsetting or frightening. When Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt and into the desert, for example, how do you think they felt? They just endured the terror of being whipped and beaten and denied their human rights by Pharaoh. They'd escaped in the night, then chased when Pharaoh changed his mind about letting them go. They'd expected to die, but had had the miraculous escape through the Red Sea. But how do you think their emotions were at that stage? They must have been emotionally exhausted, having had such a desperate time. How did they respond in this state of emotional exhaustion? They sang songs of joy. Psalm 105 verse 43 looks back at that experience and says, the Lord caused his people to leave with joy, his chosen ones with shouts of joy. Even in the awful circumstances, even when their emotions so, were so pulled all over the place, the Israelites chose joy to anticipate their future redemption. And that's why Paul writes, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. He says that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 to 18. You know, joy, in the, so far as the Bible is concerned, is an attitude that people adopt because of their hope in God's love and faithfulness. The joy of God's people is not determined by their struggles, but by their future destiny. And so, when Jesus comes into the world, uh, that's announced as good news that brings great joy. Luke chapter 2, verse 10. Now, why did it bring great joy? Well, the Israelites had been invaded by the Romans, the latest nation to oppress them. When Herod heard about it, he set out to kill Jesus and all the newborn babies in Bethlehem were, were put to death as collateral damage. It brings great joy because joy is not defined by the circumstances, but by the hope of the future destiny that event of Christ being born brings them. The Saviour is born. Jesus himself was full of joy. And after his death, his disciples were sent out and they were known as being people who were full of joy. The disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit, says Acts chapter 13, verse 52. They were filled with joy at the same time that uh, Paul and Barnabas were being persecuted and expelled from the region they were in. So joy is not a response to the circumstances. It's an attitude that's a statement of faith in the love and faithfulness of God. So even when Paul was arrested and thrown in prison, he was still able to choose joy. He called it the joy of the faith in Philippians 1 verse 25. So why is joy so important? Well, joy is a statement that resets your heart when everything around you tries to make your faith waver. When Paul's in prison, when the Israelites have barely escaped from the Egyptian army and faced an uncertain future, when the disciples were facing opposition from everyone around them, choosing joy refocuses them back onto the hope of their future destiny. 
singing songs of joy, speaking out words of joy, choosing joy. This brings our focus back to all of God's promises and our future hope. It inspires hope in the midst of hardship. It fortifies you and keeps you going. Choosing to make joy your response in life is not about ignoring or denying the grief or the hardship. St Paul talks about being full of sorrow, yet rejoicing in 2 Corinthians 6 verse 10. Joy can exist in the midst of sorrow because joy is a nevertheless word. Even in this sorrowful situation, nevertheless, I have hope because of God's promises to me. I have hope of a future in heaven. I choose joy because I choose not to be broken by my current circumstances. I may be full of sorrow, but I choose joy. I choose to reset my attention on the hope set before me. I choose to trust Jesus. All of this is captured by that great Advent statement. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Luke chapter 2 verse 10. Even though that good news is announced in difficult times, surrounded by bad circumstances, even when I am full of sorrow, I can find joy. I can choose to put my hope and my trust in the one who is utterly trustworthy and who promises me everlasting life. The shepherds who received the message from the angels had no power whatsoever to affect the situation around them. They had no political influence. They had no financial power. They had no military strength. They couldn't change the fact that the Roman Empire had been imposed on them, that they had to pay taxes to Caesar. Just before Caesar had had come along, the Jews had been suffering under the rule of a Greek leader called Antiochus Epiphanes who had banned the reading of the Torah, the the Jewish law, in the temple. And he desecrated the temple by slaughtering a pig in the Holy of Holies. And yet, in the midst of all of this, they are told, do not be afraid, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. And years later, St Paul is chained in prison, facing false charges and a very difficult future. And in the midst of that, he writes a letter to the church at Philippi that is full of the encouragement to rejoice, to be full of joy. Why? Because joy is a statement of faith. He says, this is why I am suffering here in prison. But I am not ashamed of it, for I know the one in whom I trust. And I am sure that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until the day of his return. I take my eyes off of the awful situation I'm in, and I refocus on Jesus, who is able not only to guard the work that I have done, but who is promising me eternity in heaven with him. That is the power of joy. And that is how we can be full of sorrow, yet rejoicing. Joy doesn't come to you. You seize hold of joy. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice, says Paul to the Philippian church in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Not rejoicing in the situation, but rejoicing in the promise. This is where our strength comes from. And the more difficult the situation we're in, the more we need the strength that only true joy can give us. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. 
Being full of joy in the Lord was what enabled Paul to take his eyes off the bars at his windows and the shackles on his wrists and put them onto the hope that was set before him, the promise of eternity in heaven. That promise is a reality because the Son of God has come into the world and opened up the way to heaven. And that's why when announcing the birth of Jesus, the angel said, don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy for everyone. I bring you the hope of eternal life that you now have the choice to focus upon and that will guide you to, uh, uh, and, and give you strength and perspective when life threatens to overwhelm you. That is joy. When people reject and persecute you for following me, said Jesus, be very glad because your reward is great in heaven. Choosing joy is about choosing to fix your heart and mind on the great reward that is waiting you for you in heaven. When we try and find our reward here on earth, when we pursue riches and status and comfort here in this life, the sad reality is that rather than increasing our joy, it actually decreases it. Uh, there was a study done in Sweden in 2021 about the impact of winning the lottery on your sense of happiness. And it concluded this. We find that winning large sums of money strongly affects how content you are with your personal finances, but it does not affect how you feel about other aspects of life, such as your health or your relationships with friends and family, says Eric Lindquist, a professor at Stockholm University. When the angel makes his announcement on the first Christmas, he announces not just a little joy, not just mild joy, but great joy. Joy that changes things. Joy that transforms situations. Joy that Isaiah describes as eternal joy, uh, just eternal joy, great joy, real joy is eternal. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while, says Peter in, in 1 Peter 1 verse 6. Joy is not happiness. Happiness is the reaction to circumstances being right. Joy is the choice we make, whatever the circumstances, to fix our eyes on Jesus and focus on the hope that's to come. Joy is so much more powerful than happiness because changing circumstances cannot rob you of it. You might remember that I was saying in the first talk in this series that Advent is about both Jesus' first coming and also his second coming. We look ahead to that time, to, to, to the end of all things, and we rejoice because our names are written in the book of life. We know our eternal destiny, that our reward will be great in heaven. Now you may be finding your situation really difficult at the moment. I know a lot of people are. Things are really tough in this world right now. Many are being persecuted for their faith. Many are reminded at Christmas time of loved ones that they've lost. Many feel particularly lonely. Many would say, I live a joyless life. St. Paul would say, even in the midst of that, choose joy. Choose to focus on Jesus and on the amazing future that we have promised to us. Even in the midst of the present situation, rejoice in all circumstances. Because of the hope set before you, your present circumstances are not going to be the final word in your life. Joy 
is the decision to have faith and have hope in Jesus regardless of the circumstances right now. You and I, we can have joy right now. Maybe it's being full of sorrow yet rejoicing, but joy is a decision to put our hope and our trust in Jesus, which lifts us from the prison of our despair and, and our desperation and our despondency. Advent focuses on the good news of great joy. So I want to pray for, for each one of us right now as we go through Advent, but maybe we go through Advent in, in really difficult, really testing times. Maybe that's just the, uh, the summary of your life, you would feel. But I pray in Jesus' name for the joy of the Lord to come now and fill you I pray for each one of us that we would be able to make the decision to choose joy, to choose to acknowledge that our home is in heaven, our reward is eternal, that our current circumstances will not define our, our worth or our value or our hope. I pray that we would choose to rejoice even in sorrow, even when we are unhappy. We can rejoice because the hope of the world, Jesus has come into this world. He has done all that needs to be done to open the way for us to our true home in heaven. So Lord, this, this Advent time, leading up to this Christmas time, would you fill us with joy? Would you lead us to choose joy? To choose that statement of faith that says, I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able he is able to bring about all the things he has promised in my life. So I choose joy. Thank you, Jesus, for this Advent season. Thank you for reminding us of these great themes of hope, of love, of joy, and as we'll see in our next instalment of peace. So thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I, I hope that this uh, Advent series is being a blessing to you, and I hope that it's helping you to refocus on Jesus as we move uh, towards uh, Christmas. Christmas is not just about busyness and commercialism and so on. It's all about the hope we have. In, uh, because of Jesus and because of that we choose joy see you next time God bless